Hello. Hi, everyone. Just letting people filter in. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, so much fun, this virtual edition of Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Trisha Knowles. I am the Director of Marketing and Event Sponsorship with Kingston Writers Fest, and I am so pleased and privileged to welcome you to event number 19. I can't believe we're at 19 already. Fantastic figures, the magic in all bodies. I would like to begin by acknowledging my own ancestry of being of mixed lineage from Mi'kmaq uh, or colonial known as Nova Scotia, as well as Celtic settler and the land that on which the festival customarily takes place and where I sit this afternoon in my blue dining room um, is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community here, as well as First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge our deep gratitude to have the opportunity to connect with you uh, and with the land here today. As I mentioned, uh, I am of mixed ancestry. I'm sitting in a blue dining room with a bookshelf behind me wearing a multicolored blouse and I have curly brown hair and brown eyes. This event is being transcribed and if you'd like to access the closed captioning, uh, if you don't see the button for transcription on your screen, we have posted a link in the chat for you this afternoon. Uh, in addition to the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage on Ontario Arts Council and the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council. Uh, we'd like to thank you for your ongoing support of the festival. We are so grateful to these organizations and to you individuals who continue to support Kingston Writers Fest year after year, especially in this second year of our virtual presentation. We would especially like to thank uh, the Governor General Literary Awards, uh, the government sponsor of this event is in celebration of the Governor General Awards. We'd also like to thank Alison Braithway, the author patron, excuse me, author patron of Aaron Ball, and Corey Medical Pharmacy, Tim and Chris Everdell, who are the author patrons of Amanda Leduc. This event will be an hour long. It includes a question and answer period. So feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at any point during the event for the moderator. And if you'd like to support the authors, please pick up a copy of their books at our official bookseller novel idea. They have copies available to purchase in store by phone or online. And if you are from outside of the area and you are unable to purchase from Novel Idea, we would encourage you to purchase from your local bookseller. We're going to give away a copy of both Amanda and Therese's uh, collections at the end of the event. So make sure you stick around for the end of the event, especially if you've pre-registered. Now I am absolutely delighted to introduce this event's moderator, Aaron Ball. I met Aaron at least a dozen years ago and have been in awe of her courageous nature and her brilliant creativity since then. She is the owner and operator of Kingston Circus Arts and is the co-founder of Legacy Circus. It's a performance company co-created with mad artist Vanessa Furlong. Traveling worldwide to perform and teach, Erin strives for representation, centering access, and inclusion in the arts. In 2017, Erin developed a course and manual for movement-based coaches, specifically circus, but it does apply to movement in general, called Flying Footless. The course centers around dismantling ableism, disability theory, an access-centered method of teaching, 
and suggestions to work towards welcoming the disability community into movement-based classes. She has won accessibility awards and in 2018 was the recipient of the Creators Award at the Mayor's Arts Award. Please join me in welcoming the lovely Erin Ball. Thank you so much, Tricia. This is Erin speaking. Uh, thank you for inviting me to moderate this panel discussion. Thank you to the um, Kingston Writers Fest. Um, thanks for your land acknowledgement, Tricia. I would like to add a little bit to that. Uh, and I will be mentioning Indigenous harm. It'll be over in about two minutes. So if you would like to leave and come back, please do. My pronouns are she and her. I am a white femme and double baloney amputee. I identify as a mad artist from the mad pride movement. And in addition to what Trisha said about the land, um, I was born here on this uh, traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Ojibwe. And for me, moving forward with justice in mind means remembering and learning the true histories of this land and creating good connections with indigenous communities who are here today. I also acknowledge that there is ongoing harm, murder, no access to clean drinking water, and so much more. I am committed to being active around indigenous rights and dismantling systemic oppression, both in my artistic practice and outside of it. I'll give a content warning for the session. There will be mention of trauma, grief, amputation, and ableism. Please take care of yourselves and take breaks as needed. I am so excited to welcome and chat with Amanda LeDuc and Therese Estachon. I've known of both of them and we've connected via social media, but this is the first time actually meeting. This session will be a combination of questions from me and readings by the authors. And then the Q&A at the end. Amanda LeDuc is the author of the novels, The Centaur's Wife and The Miracles of Ordinary Men, as well as the nonfiction book, Disfigured, on fairy tales, disability, and making space, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Governor General's Award in Nonfiction. She has cerebral palsy and lives in Hamilton, Ontario, where she serves as the communications coordinator for the Festival of Literary Diversity, or FOLD. Therese Estachon is part of the Visayan diaspora community. She is an elementary school teacher and is studying to be a psychotherapist. Therese is also a bilateral below knee and partial hands amputee and identifies as a disabled person or a person with a disability. Therese lives in Tacoronto. Her poems have been published in CV2 and Pank Magazine and were shortlisted for the 2021 Marina Nemet Award. Her first collection of poems, Phantom Pains, was published by Book Hug in spring 2021. Before we get into our first reading, I'll start with a question for you both. I think a lot about disability and disability theories and how disabled folks experience the current world. And I also really value imagining different possibilities of futures and realities. And the way that you've both combined fantasy with storytelling through lived experience of disability is so intriguing. Why did you choose fantasy and folk tales and how was it for you to combine with stories of disability? Mm -hmm. Reese, would you like to go? No, go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, I really like living in a fantastical world. Um, I have been writing stories that are sort of fabulous or incorporate fairy tale elements for a long time. Um, and it wasn't really until uh, the last 10 years that I, I really sort of even though I'd been writing that sort of stuff for a long time, I, I had a really long sense of feeling like that kind of writing wouldn't be taken seriously in the Canadian literary landscape, such as it was. 
And I, so I was sort of convinced that I needed to, you know, write the Alice Monroe story in order to be taken seriously as a writer. Um, but I was always drawn to stories that had magical, fantastical elements. And so over the last 10 years or so, I've been incorporating incorporating that into my work a lot more and it's just they're just the kinds of stories that I like to write um, my mind automatically goes into magical uh, realms now and when I was writing The Centaur's Wife I initially started writing it as a dystopia I was just interested in the question of what happens when you desire something that you can't have um, and that question of desire became a question of grief because of course grieving and the process of grieving is about desiring something that you'll never be able to have, something that you can never get back. Mm -hmm. And um, it was in the process of that, that disability act actually worked its way into The Centaur's Wife. So it wasn't, I didn't start out thinking that it was gonna be a novel about disability, but in the course of writing it, that became quite clear. So, I mean, maybe I had an unconscious um, sense of, of that was what the story was going to be about, but it didn't really reveal itself to me until about, I'd say maybe two years into the writing of it. And once that happened, then a lot more about the book um, kind of fell into place. It's a novel about storytelling um, and specifically about how we tell stories to survive trauma and, and how we you know, grasp at fantastical things as a way of making sense of the real world, which in many ways does not make sense. Um, so yeah, so yeah that, those were sort of the, the reasonings behind it. Um, well, similar to you, Amanda, I mean, I also gravitate towards towards that genre, uh, myth and uh, folk tales and fairy tales. Um, and I really like sort of these genres because of the archetypes that um, they provide for us as humans to kind of enter into and feel as if we are not the only people that have experience things like trauma or grief or this longing, um, sense of longing or sense of um, searching for meaning. And I think, you know, the, the genre of like folk tales, fairy tales and myth, it, they're really, really old mm -hmm. and they're really easy to relate to. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do as well was preserve the sort of the horror mythology I was told as a child in the Philippines. And I didn't want to explicitly talk about what had occurred to me. And I thought maybe I can combine both. And I found it to be quite like easy. It was surprisingly easy to combine both. And I think it's because that genre itself, like I said, it's kind of like old and universal the themes found within that genre. And um, yeah, I think that's why I gravitate, gravitate towards myths and folk tales and fairy tales. Thank you both. Um, I will pass it back to you to do a reading. Um, and if you feel like sharing why you chose the particular passage or anything else about it, please do. Mm -hmm. Either one of us or? Yeah, whoever would like to go first. Okay, um, I, can, I can go. And I should say, um, I, I didn't say this when I first started speaking, but I should. I am speaking to everyone today from the traditional territories of the Huron, Wendat, the Erie, the Neutral, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas, um, also known as Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, this area is part of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resource around the Great Lakes. And as a white settler, um, as a disabled white settler, it makes me think every minute of every day about how we care for the land around us and then also how we care for each other. And I think um, it's something that I always think about, but it's something that has become quite sharply in relief for me during the pandemic. Um, this question of how we care for one another as a society uh, is really something that's never far from my mind. Um, and it's a question that I explore in my writing a lot. Um, so by using that as a, as a kind of introduction, um, I'm gonna read just a little bit from the beginning of The Centaur's Wife. 
Uh, and it's essentially a, a novel, a dystopian novel that takes place after a natural disaster. Um, the world has kind of been decimated by a meteor shower. And it's about a group of survivors who come together to um, rebuild uh, what civilization they can. Uh, and they also happen to live at the foot of a mountain, which may or may not have magical centaurs living in said mountain. So this beginning is just a little bit of a mythological um, introduction to the centaurs themselves. In the beginning, a horse fell in love with a woman. Because magic was strong in the ground there, the horse dug himself a grave on his mountain and slept in it, buried in the dirt, on the one night a year when the stars are at their brightest. In the morning, he climbed out of the dirt as a man and made his way down the mountain. He stole clothes from a line when no one was looking and learned human language by watching men and women in the market square. The mountain's magic was still with him, so he learned quickly. And by the time he reached the woman's village, you would never have guessed that he still had the heart of a stallion. He'd been beautiful as a horse, black maned and black skinned, a white star in the center of his forehead. And he was beautiful as a man, black skinned and tall, a shock of white in his dark hair. The woman fell in love with him almost right away. He seemed wild to her, but also familiar. She sensed a power in him that she wanted for herself, a different set of eyes with which to view the world. They courted and were married before the moon changed. The entire village came out to the wedding. After the music and the dancing were over, the villagers left them in the wedding tent, bright-eyed and flushed, two very nearly strangers who were surprised to find themselves alone. The woman was so beautiful he was afraid to touch her. She had lilies in her soft hair and designs painted up and down her arms. The designs asked for happiness, health, children, an ever-loving husband, all of the good things anyone might wish a bride. The husband felt the symbols reach out and touch his stallion's heart for the smallest of instants, felt them know the lie that he was carrying and pull away. A draft blew through the room and then the air cleared again. I'll stop there. Thanks, Amanda. Um, sorry. I'd also like to read the land acknowledgement I have prepared. Um, I want to thank the indigenous peoples of this land. Um, I wrote my poems in the land of the Anishinaabe, Kiran Wendat. Odinashani and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations, and in the north, the land of the Dene people. Much of my editing was done in Montreal, which is protected by the Kanokiaga. The land gave me comfort and solace. The old rocks in Dinede, the ice road, the trees, in my parents' backyard, the sky and wind, they were there for me. I was trying to put my grief into words. They often gave me the language I was looking for. My writing is dependent on the land and its original people. I'm a guest here from the diaspora of the Philippines, and I'm deeply grateful for that. The story I will be, and a bit of a visual description, um, I have brown skin, long black hair, uh, and I have a uh, bookcase behind me. And if you ever meet me out in the street, what I would say is I'm also bilateral below the amputee and wear prosthetic legs, and I have these uh, awesome rose tattoos uh, going up my forearms. Um, I'm going to read a, uh, a poem, a prose poem called the Aswan. And it's uh, a, one, um, one of the poems from sort of like the five poems I have that um, uh, where the intent was to preserve these horror mythos that I was told as a child. Aswan. An Aswan is a type of a bat that eats flesh. Aswangs are found all across the islands and vary in form and personality. One story of a known female Aswang in Cebu goes like this. Sexy by day, at night she moves any way she pleases. Sometimes she ends up at the disco where she laughs, magsayo sayo siya og maghubog, dances and gets drunk. She laughs and pretends she's interested in your cock, excuses herself, leaves, finds a hiding spot, dismembers hides her legs by the garbage, grows fangs and wings, becomes hideous, but keeps her perky tits. And she waits for you perched on the roof. When you leave, that's when she gets you. 
Hunt, swoop, crunch, and glug. Dayon, then, she puts herself back together again, full. Trapuhan niya yung tutoy, cleans her tits, struts home. There is one way to catch her, though, if you had the courage. This Aswang has never figured out what to do with her intestines. So, if you ever find yourself walking out at night and see a long, moist cord swaying in the dark, run. Pero ako, ako siyang atangan, kai. But I, I wait longingly for her. I wish, I wish I was her. I wish I could put back together my dismembered body, snapping my bones inside, tucking in my loose muscles and nerves, folding in my fangs and wings, and saluds akong lawas daghan yod og sundang. Inside my body, thousands of knives. I wish to be like her, the whore butcher with a swinging rectum. Thank you both. I got chills with both of your readings for different reasons. Um, and I want to come back to talking about uh, both of them. But Amanda, you um, mentioned things that have become really um, important in the pandemic. And I would love to uh, talk about that next. Um, for, I imagine that for both of you, some of your writing or some of your process happened during the pandemic. And I'm curious how that influenced either your writing or your process or um, wherever you were in that moment or still are. <laughs> um, Amanda, is it okay if I go? For, yeah, I don't wanna always be like, Amanda, go first. <laughs> um, the pandemic, so I wasn't really writing a lot this time around. Um, but what I can say is, um, you know, I was, fortunately, I was invited to a bunch of amazing festivals, like The Fold, where Amanda, you know, um, is one of the main sort of uh, curators for, um, and organizers. And uh, it really, it was interesting because so much of my work has to do with my body and the visibil visibility, visibility of my body because of my disability that I felt like during the pandemic that was lost a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that opportunity for people to see me and receive me that way um, was a bit lost. And I'm curious to, to feel what it would be like, you know, once things open up again and Hopefully I'll be invited to spaces again. And I'm curious to see how I will be in that space and how I will read and interact with others. But yeah, I felt that was kind of the, the loss of Zoom. But on the other side of things, because the pandemic, I found myself working a lot, like I went back to teaching full time. Um, and I, wa I was, you know, reading at, at these events. It felt like uh, it wasn't that exhausting for me. I think if I had to go to like spaces and kind of get ready and uh, for a reading, I think I might have been a lot more tired. So it was kind of, you know, pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, so my, my best friend uh, passed away in December of 2019 from breast cancer. Um, so I, I had a period of about a year and a half after her death uh, where I didn't write at all. Um, and I actually had real difficulty reading as well, um, which was an interesting, I mean, interesting is, is an interesting word to use to describe that, but it was an interesting experience for me because so much of the way that I ground myself as a, a writer and as a reader is, is through books and through stories. And I just was not, I just wasn't in a place where I could, uh, have them in my life like I just couldn't they would come into my life but they would just also sort of go like if I had to read something it wouldn't stick with me for very long um, and as someone who has you know I've always been writing stories I've always been reading books that was a very surreal experience um, and you know, thankfully that has passed now to a certain extent and I've been able to write a lot more um, starting in the summer I, I felt some ideas come back and I'm working on a new novel now. Um, so that has been really great. But there is, like Therese was saying, there was something about um, 
existing in the space where suddenly you just had to spend a lot of time by yourself and not be around people that I, I think maybe in addition to the grief contributed to the um the lack of inspiration for a better word um because there's a certain kind of energy that happens for me when I'm interacting with other people and talking about books in person, um, which is not to say that Zoom isn't also wonderful because it definitely is. And it's been, you know, 95, well, probably closer to like 99% of the interactions that I've had with people over the last year and a half have been on Zoom. And I'm so grateful for the magic inherent in that and the way that the world has changed in some ways that have made it so much more accessible for people who maybe, you know, weren't able to participate in literary festivals, um, mostly as spectators, right? A lot of people in the past have not been able to come to literary festivals for a wide variety of reasons. And now that is available to everyone. Um, I, I feel like I'm rambling, but I guess I guess what I ultimately am saying is, is that the pandemic, the last year and a half, uh, coupled with the grief that I was already feeling, um, has really kind of shaken me up as a writer, as a reader, as a person. Um, and I guess I'm still in that process of trying to figure out what happens in this new world, right? Because there's no what happens after this is over. Like this is this is the world that we live in now. And the pandemic and, and moving through the various phases of the pandemic is going to be with us for a long time. Uh, and I'm trying to give myself and others uh, a lot of grace in trying to figure all of that out um, because it seems to constantly be changing. Does that, does any of that ring true for you, Erin, as well? I mean, I'm curious to know what you feel as, as well. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely agree. Um, I have felt quite alone and um, I, I would say on the, on the performing side, um, I felt very creative, uh, but writing for me during the pandemic has been um, pretty much non-existent. And I keep thinking, oh, you know, there's all this time and we're, we've paused and this should be the time that I'm doing this, but I haven't um, been able to access that um, really much at all. And uh, Therese, you mentioned um, the visibility of disability and during the pandemic. And that's something I've been um, thinking about a lot, um, both in ways that we are, you know, in um, disability spaces and also not in disability spaces. And some of the things that um, I'm sure we all experience uh, outside in, in the world that were happening before um, are not happening <laughs> because it is all through um, Zoom and we can kind of control some of the, the spaces that we're in. So that's been um, interesting. Um, yeah, thank you for asking me. Um, so I'll move on. Uh, Therese, you're reading your words about becoming an amputee. Very powerful words. Um, and at times it made me feel like I was reading my own thoughts, uh, which was a very <laughs> weird experience. Um, I did cry a lot. Um, and I wanna thank you for sharing such uh, intense poems. And um, I think that knowing that we're not alone in some of the extreme things that we experience creates some comfort. Um, so thank you. And uh, I was really interested about learning about the difference between phantom pain and phantom sensations. So thank you for writing about that. Um, I didn't know that there was a name for the constant buzzing in my legs. Um, and Amanda, you wrote about trauma and grief and you sprinkled in education about ableism and the medical model in things like, um, you know, trying to fix Heather or begging uh, the centrist to fix Heather and um, some of the ableist language. I really uh, appreciated how, how you uh, wove that in. You both intertwined trauma and magic. And I often perform about my own trauma and I know how that impacts my process every time I'm reliving that. 
And I'm curious how it is for both of you to uh, share your experiences with audiences. Um, Therese, do you mind if I, I go with this one? Um, I think I, so I had a nonfiction book come out last year, Disfigured, which was um, about growing up as a disabled woman and, and how that has, you know, impacted my reading of fairy tales. And um, people would often ask me like how I felt about talking about that book because a lot of it talks about being bullied in school because of the way that I walk. I walk with a very visible limp and, um, and things like that. And it was interesting to me because people always seem to sort of expect that talking about it would be really, really difficult. And I actually don't find talking about my disability as such that difficult at all because writing the book was a process of um, coming to a, a period of just uh, pride really in, in my disability and how it has shaped me and how it has made me who I am. So I had kind of worked through some things in the book that, that put me in a, a place of just feeling really at comfort and, and really at ease with it. And with the novel, actually, um, I, I had assumed it would be an entirely different experience. I had assumed that because it was a novel and because it was fiction, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, have that kind of um, that kind of visceral reaction um, in in that way, uh, and it it has turned out to be the entirely opposite in some ways. It's very much a novel about going through trauma and about going through grief. And even though I had written the novel and essentially finished it before my friend passed away, going back to the novel and reading through it and suddenly talking about it and recognizing that I was talking about my own particular grief journey and had been writing toward a grief journey, even without recognizing that that was what was happening at the time, um, has been a really uh, difficult thing in, in some ways. And the larger social issues that come up in the novel of, you know, when society collapses, how do we take care of the most vulnerable among us um, in light of, you know, the, the pandemic going on, that has also been brought into really sharp relief for me. And that's something that I struggle with because I think we'd like to think that, and I certainly did when I was writing the book, I would like to think that in an ideal world, you know, we might be grudging about it in some ways, but people do come together and care for one another. Um, and I, I have been saddened to watch in the news and, and you know, see in the world around us that that is maybe not as true as I had hoped that it would be. I, I don't know that everybody is caring for everyone else in the ways that you know, we, we really need to do as a society. I certainly don't think people are caring for disabled people um, in, in ways that we need. Uh, having said that, um, I, I don't think you know, it's hopeless. Um, I, I think it, it just requires a lot of facing the issue head on and, and disability in particular is something that I think people have, non-disabled people have tried to look away from for a really long time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I think I really resonate um, with you, Amanda, about this idea of kind of finding pride in being disabled. And when I was, because I was not born with a disability, so my experience as a disabled person is a bit different from someone who was born with a disability. And after I, I you know, got sick and after my amputations and after my release from the rehab hospital, it was really challenging for me to be with my body and imagine myself like living in my body and doing the things I used to do. So I went through a lot of grief and, uh, you know, anxiety and depression. And I decided just to write it out because that would give me like a cathartic release and also something to do. And um, I also, uh, you know, I took some poetry courses at U of T at their School of Continuing Studies and it was one of my ways of like introducing myself back into the world by going to school because it's, you know, being a teacher and having always been in school like that was comfortable for me. And um, I kind of realized later, I thought, you know what, I would like to actually 
have this be published as a book so I can have the world see me in a different way, not just as the disabled girl who has a difficult time walking or um, eating a sandwich. <laughs> so I wanted to, then I started to write a couple poems with the intent of actually pushing up against like the ableism I experienced in the hospital or the ableism I experience every day just walking down the street. And that, you know, there's a lot of rage that I feel when I feel like someone's being ableist. And like you're, fr I was frozen in my rage because I can't actually say stop looking at me because like in, in, in one hand, like I don't know if they're looking. So I thought maybe I'll start to write about these things that I'm feeling kind of like that I'm repressing so that I can kind of feel as if I'm giving myself comfort in that way. And um, I always had this fantasy of one day, you know, being invited to festivals and being included and having the work be um, kind of like out there and like celebrated in a way that that honored what I had gone through. So I'm very lucky that this is happening now for sure. Um, and, and on one hand, talking about it has given me like a major sense of purpose and has kind of motivated me to keep on writing because I have more ideas about, you know, disability justice and, in relation to ableism, in relation to kind of things like melancholy, for instance, or even inspiration porn. Um, so yeah, I think it's done really well for my mental health to actually write about it and have it be received. So I'm very, you know, happy that that's kind of a, a privilege that I have currently. Thank you both. Um, yeah, I feel the same way about putting my own work out. Um, I feel like it is very helpful. It was helpful for me in terms of accepting and um, woo, I definitely identify with that rage. <laughs> um, one thing that I find though, um, for me is that writing, and I've been trying to think of why this is, I feel like the writing about my own experiences is very hard. Um, and I feel like performing it, uh, that gives me that sense of empowerment. And I'm wondering, how do you take care of yourselves while you're writing this intense uh, material that is your own experiences? Um, I mean, for me, when I, when I was writing the memoir, um, parts of Disfigured specifically, I think one of the things that helped was, was knowing that, I mean, everything that's in the book is true, but it obviously chronologically didn't happen to me in the way that it's portrayed in the book, right? It's woven in amongst fairy tales. I have some scenes that happen to me when I'm quite young, you know, happen later in the book. So there's an element of craft um, in writing nonfiction that I found really helpful because it put a certain amount of distance between me and the things that had happened to me. I could create um, create a narrative. I could reclaim the narrative in, in some ways. And, and so that was really, really helpful. Um, and then when I write fiction, um, just, just getting lost in a magical world is very therapeutic for me and allowing my imagination to kind of go anywhere is, is something that I find really empowering, even if, you know, it's something that eventually gets torn down by an editor and I have to replace or, you know, redo or rework a thousand times. Um, I guess for myself, you know, sometimes the grief it just catches you off guard and it's really difficult to bounce back. Um, but one of the things that I did when I wrote the book was I went to Denede or Yellowknife where it was really, the land was all around you and it was accessible and it was spacious. And I didn't have the pressures that I had when I was living in kind of in the city in Toronto. So that was really helpful. And I, you know, I sought psychotherapy and I think that has been like a huge help for me is to be able to talk about it and kind of explore these feelings with um, somebody who's 
my psychotherapist who's super supportive and um, who challenges sort of like the internalized ableism that I have in, in my head. Um, but I, I'm very grateful that I have close friends and family that you know support me and that are here for me. Um, so in a way, one of the things that I do is I, I reach out to them. Um, if I'm ever feeling like I, I need sort of that extra TLC. Um, but I, I also reach out to other authors that I feel like have gone through a lot. Like one of my favorite authors is James Baldwin. And I remember reading him a lot and thinking, okay, like life is hard and the world is unfair, but you have it. Like you're, you've got it. You can continue being yourself essentially you don't have to cave so um reading has been really helpful as well and kind of making me feel like i'm not alone thank you both we have time for one more question time is flying um before we open up the q a my last question to both of you, um, writing can be interpreted in so many ways. And for me, the centaurs, Amanda, uh, were metaphors for disability, especially with lines like, they are not monsters, they're only different. And Therese, the way that you combine the two languages and folklore with stories, like the one of the merman, also makes me think of disability and the possibility of a fin, which is different and amazing. And I've definitely spent time dreaming up costume quote unquote legs and fins are typically part of that. Um, and you've both created these artistic worlds sprinkled with culture, disability rights, disability justice, magic and storytelling. How do you build these worlds and what do they mean to you? I know we've touched on this a bit, Is it okay if I go, yeah? yeah? How do I build these worlds? I don't, you know, I'm not really sure. I think sometimes when I write, I just go with what's present at, in, you know, in the moment. Um, poetry is probably different from fiction in, the, in, in a sense that, well, I don't know actually, maybe Amanda, you can tell me, but in a sense that, um, Anyways, my poems, sometimes I have like a line stuck in my head and I just kind of go with that. Or I have a dream or I have a feeling and I sort of build from there. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the folk tales that I had, those were stories that I already had banked in my memory. So I kind of just built from my memory and layered it on top with sort of uh, images and kind of continued to layer it on top. And then I would pare it down and pare it down, pare it down. Um, but, you know, a lot of my poems are really, um, you know, were really, I guess, rendered by the memories that I had that I wanted to sort of get rid of in a way because they were really difficult and traumatic, like the memories I have of being in the ICU. And I, you know, for some of them, I wanted to be really explicit. And for others, I wanted to be a little bit more vague. So um, it, it varies from poem to poem. Um, sometimes I build up and sometimes I pare down. And I have poems that I just like don't share. <laughs> and they're just kind of for me. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is quite similar, um, Therese, because I for me, uh, I, I started it I started the centaur's wife basically with just this image of a woman who I knew was in love with a centaur um, for, and I didn't even know why, um, but there was just this sort of thread of desire between them. And then I built from there, like things slowly started coming together and the world kind of um, came together as the story came together. So I didn't go into it thinking about what the world looked like or having really a clear idea of anything apart from it's kind of like um, some, I'm forgetting who the author is who said this, but but sometimes writing is, is like traveling in a car 
uh, at night with your headlights on. And the only thing that you can see in front of you is essentially like 15 feet in front of your car. But that allows you to get from point A to point B. Um, darn, I wish I knew who it was. Was it maybe Elmore Leonard? Anyway, um, that very much is, is what it was like for me. Um, and I think um, to your point, Therese, when you were talking about how it, it you know, each poem can be different um, and, and your feelings about each poem can be different in the way you approach them. I think my feelings about stories and about you know, novels uh, and my approach to novels changes with each particular project. Um, I wish it was not that way. I wish I, I had you know, a process that was like tried and true and you know, worked the same way for me every single time. It would be so much easier. Um, but it's also less fun that way. And I think part of the, the magic of, of dealing with these myths and you know, folk, folklore and fables and fairy tales is the unpredictability that they bring to a narrative. Um, and, and weaving that in can be a real, a real source of pleasure and a real gift, um, particularly when, when dealing with, and Therese, you've talked about this before and you explore it so beautifully in your book, when you're dealing with um, really, really deep, difficult things like grief and trauma, it can be really cathartic and, and really um, exciting to look at those inexplicable things through an inexplicable lens, if that makes sense. Yes. Thank you both. Um, do we have questions from the audience? We are down to 10 minutes. You can put your questions in the Q&A box if you have any. I have a question for Therese. Therese, are you, um, are you working on anything else right now? And are you looking at incorporating folklore and myth into your work again? Uh, yes, thanks for asking. Um, I'm working on a number of essays. So um, I'm working on, uh, I mean, so being, you know, in psychotherapy school, the readings have been very intense and I was like, man, I better use these readings because they're so difficult and I'm powering through them. I, I better incorporate them in my writing. So I'm, I, I'm working on a essay on inspiration porn as it relates to melancholy. Mm -hmm. And I'm also working on an essay on the Aswang, which, you know, the folktale I read as, you know, the Aswang relates to being uh, the rejected object in the psyche. Um, so I'm working on these two essays and a longer prose piece about my time back home as well. Um, but I don't know, finding time to write them some, some days, I'm like, uh, I don't know. I'd rather just like go on my bike or have a beer <laughs> or something. So, but thanks for asking. And how about you both? Uh, I am working on a new novel, um, which is even weirder than The Centaur's Wife ended up being, which is uh, a fun exercise. Um, it is about a pair of married hyenas who uh, walk on two legs like people and talk like humans. Um, and they basically sort of operate as these kind of godlike figures who, who move through a novel and influence um, people in a variety of ways, um, particularly as it relates to disability, actually. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So, and I'm, I'm also hoping to actually write um, a book about my friend who passed away and our friendship. So I've sort of been, I can feel myself like girding my loins and, and getting like stealing myself, getting ready to, to delve back into that because I think that is going to be a, a difficult project. Um, but it's it's nice to know, especially after a year and a half of not not really working and not really writing in that sense. Nice to know that there are things on the horizon that that have captivated my attention. And for you, Erin, what are you working on right now? Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, writing wise, I am hoping to do a retreat uh, in October to just get away and try to 
yeah, carve out some space for that. Um, I'll start with an update to the manual that I have, and then we'll see what happens from there. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, there's a couple of questions here. Um, from Derek, how does one keep the motivation and writer momentum if your job requires business writing and by day's end, you feel empty? Uh, sorry, by day's end, you feel empty to tackle your creative writing. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I'll jump in here um, just to say that I really, I really resonate with this and I really understand. Um, I love my day job and I have a lot of freedom and flexibility with it, but it is in communications and marketing essentially. And, and um, there are definitely days where I finish and I'm just like, I have no creative energy left. Um, and for me, it has actually become really important to block off periods of time, um, even if I have to psych myself up toward them. Uh, I took some time off at the end of this summer, or end of July, rather, so two weeks, end of July, beginning of August. And I psyched myself up for a good, like, three weeks beforehand. I was like, okay, I'm going to take this time off, and I'm going to write, I'm going to write, I'm going to write, I'm going to write. And it was great because I, I started, you know, about a week out, I started thinking about things that I wanted to write down. Um, and I basically just held it all until I was sort of fit to bursting. And then during that period of time, I was really able to get a lot of work done or, or a lot of words down on the page. Um, so even, even the practice of setting aside, you know, half an hour um, during the weekend or half an hour, two evenings a week, um, and, and making a ritual of it has, has been, you know, um, during those times when I cannot devote like an entire week to, to writing, um, that has been really helpful for me to really treat it as ritualized sacred time, um, during which I don't have to do anything else to really approach the writing as a kind of gift, a kind of luxury that I can, um, just roll around in has, has really helped to make it feel not like work because it is, it is another kind of work, right? It's work that we enjoy. Um, and the key for me has been to make it feel like a gift as well. Thank you. The next question is from Anita and I'll pass this one to you, Therese. Do you find that fantasy is taken more or less seriously in Canadian literature as time progresses? Um, I'm not sure. I think perhaps, I don't know. I don't know the stats. Um, maybe more. I mean, what is fantasy? You know, fantasy is a wish to have, to experience a reality that you're not experiencing at the current moment. Mm -hmm. So whether or not we enter fantasy through a specific genre or we enact a fantasy in our writing to write a wrong, you know, to write an injustice. Um, maybe then yes, if that's what we mean by fantasy. Um, but, you know, it's a, that's the thing about fantasy. Fantasy is an enactment of, um, I don't know, I don't know. In psychotherapy, it's very different, the word fantasy. In psychotherapy, the word fantasy is like, an enactment of something that you can't get out of. So I think maybe in genre, fantasy is a writing of something that you wish to get out of or you wish were different. And I think most writing is like that. Most writing explores that. So um, then I would say yes then. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but in terms of like, you know, books that gear towards that specific genre and how well they're doing currently in, in our landscape. Maybe Amanda might know more, but... Um, um, I, I can speak to this a little bit, um, although Therese, as always, your, your answers to things are so beautiful and, and uh, lovely, and, and I could listen to you for hours. Oh, shut <laughs> um, in, in terms of the sort of the um, nuts and bolts, like books sold copies kind of uh, element of it. I do think there has been a real shift probably within the last decade of fantasy and it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's wider components. So, you know, speculative literature, uh, science fiction, um, 
you know, fabulism, um, magic realism from Latinx authors. Um, I think there's there's been a lot more of that being quote unquote taken seriously in um, Canadian literature, in in wider literatures as well. There's a real move in the U.S. If you look at readers like Carmen Maria Machado um, and Sequoia Nembagatsu, who has a novel coming out um, early next year, um, and then you know writers like David Mitchell and, and things like that, there's it's really gained just a certain amount of momentum. I do think in Canadian literature, so I went to the University of Victoria for my undergrad in writing um, from 20, uh, 2002 to 2006. And there was this like apocryphal story told in the writing department at that time that a few years before I was there, so maybe the end of the nineties, there was a student who came and he had actually written a series of fantasy novels under a pseudonym that were massively popular in the UK. And he'd actually made a lot of money and he didn't tell anybody in the writing program about it until he'd been in the program for like three years. So almost by the time he was finished being in school, um, because there was this idea that fantasy writing, you know, was not serious in the way that um, literary fiction was serious. And, um, I, you know, I, I definitely felt that when I was in my undergrad, I, I really worried about writing the kinds of things that I wanted to write, which were about, you know, men turning into angels and, and like weird things happening to people. Um, and I worried about it being taken seriously. I didn't think it was the kind of writing that publishers would want to publish, um, the kind of stuff that, you know, would, would get reviewed or things like that. Um, and part of that was my own bias, like part of that was my own fear. But I, I think part of it was, at the time, definitely part of the culture. And that has changed. I think there's also a lot more of um, genre blending that's happening now, where you have books that straddle those lines. Um, I mean, even Therese, with your work, right? You have a, a book of poetry that's also including prose and, and you know shifting from one form to the next. And I think there's a real power um, in all of that, because I, I think it, it speaks to how we are recognizing as a society and as a world that these sort of artificial barriers that we put between things really are beginning to break down and we really are having to consider anew through our literature and through the way that we interact with people, what it means to exist alongside one another and what it means to celebrate the things that connect all of us. Um, long rambly answer, my apologies. Uh, but yes, that, that is what I think. Um, it's, it's a good trend. It's on the up and up, I think. More weird things in literature everywhere is my, my you know, prescription <laughs> for what ails us. Thank you. We have pretty much no time, but one very short question. Uh, what myth or fable has inspired you most? Oof. I don't know if it's a specific myth um, so much as the, the idea of the transformation myth. Um, the idea of something becoming something else has always really fascinated me. Um, I think partly because I, when I was a younger disabled person, was always thinking about transforming into a body that was able-bodied so a body that wasn't mine um, and now I think about it in the reverse I think about you know being born someone who ostensibly like I was born with cerebral palsy but we didn't realize how my disability was going to impact my life until I was about four or five so the transition happens the other way now going from someone who was normal whatever that means right when she was born to existing in a different body and, and how do you make that journey. So that that is the, the fable, I think, and the myth that really speaks to me. Um, yeah, similar to you, Amanda, I don't have one particular, but I really love trickster myths. Mm -hmm. I think the trickster myth, one, they're, they're mostly comical, and I love that they exist in kind of like this chiaroscuro matter where you don't know if they're, if they're good, you don't know if they're bad, but you like them anyways. Mm -hmm. And there's usually some kind of like disaster that happens, but somehow this chaos kind of is what was needed or works out. So I think the trickster myths are what I'm, I'm generally drawn to. 
Thank you both so much for being in this conversation with me. Really appreciate it. Great to meet you both. Thank you to Trisha and the Kingston Writers Fest. Trisha, I will pass it back over to you. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you, Fariz Estacion, Amanda Luduc, and Erin Ball. A uh, quick reminder, our author's books are available for sale now at Novel Idea. And uh, speaking of trickster myths, tomorrow we chat with the author of the trickster trilogy, Eden Robinson, which will be a lot of fun. I uh, would like to congratulate Emma Rhodes, winner of a copy of The Centaur's Wife, and to Annie Milne, winner of a copy of Therese's poetry collection, Phantom Pains. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for joining us and supporting Kingston Writers Fest. Uh, be sure to check our website for the rest of the great lineup, including that conversation tomorrow afternoon with Eden. Tonight, following the big idea, which is addressing a crisis with Carol off, we are continuing the After Dark Later Night series with the Kingston Writers Fest. Uh, we welcomed Amber Dawn and Molly Cross Blanchard last night, a fabulous event hosted by Kingston Writers Fest new artistic director, Ara McCulley. That's going to continue this evening at 8.30 with Kevin Lambert, author of You Will Love What You Have Killed. And I'm just going to post a link to that event for tonight with Kevin and Ara. I think that anyone who um, kind of has a bit of an alternative mindset or, or an alternative way of approaching um, I guess the the societal norm uh, will really enjoy this. So check it out on the website. There are some content warnings uh, for that event tonight. So a little darker subject matter uh, if that is your cup of tea. But uh, thank you all so very much for being here. I would invite our author patrons to stick around. Allison, Tim, and Chris, if you're in the audience, if you want to just raise your hand, I'm going to pull you in as a panelist so you can meet the authors after the event. Uh, thank you for everyone for sticking around. We went a couple of minutes over, so uh, just cognizant of the time. Have a great night. Thank you so much. <laughs>